so now we are going to solve the return question see the question here the Fourier transform of a signal function is so means from this question they are asking that what is the Fourier transform of a signal function so what are these four options option which is true by j omega is the accurate solution of this question so we have to find what is the Fourier transform of a signal function so, so let's solve this numerical so this is a graph of the signal function as you can see clearly here so this is f of t for t less than 0 its value is minus 1 and for t greater than 0 its value is plus 1 so this is a signal function this is a pictorial way so let me write in the algebraic fashion which is so signal function is a mathematical format which is f of t is equal to plus 1 for t greater than 0 and its value is equal to minus 1 for t less than 0 so for this function we need to find what is the Fourier transform so this is nothing but so this right this i can call this u of t and this is called as the minus of u of minus t so you have to add these two functions then you are going to get the overall function f of t f of t is equal to u of t plus minus into u of minus t it is equal to u of t minus of u of minus t so this is the overall pictorial this is the mathematical expression of this function f of t with respect to time so this is u of t and this is minus of u of minus t just add these two things will get this overall function f of t so this is called as a signal function so now let me find what is the Fourier transform of the this unit step function u of t so for the u of t the Fourier transform is 1 by j omega plus pi into delta of omega so 1 by j omega plus pi into delta of omega so this is a very important formula always you have to remember so the Fourier transform of the uh, the unit step function u of t is 1 by j omega plus pi into delta of omega so now i want to find what is the Fourier transform of the u of minus t so wherever omega is there this is 2 plus omega by minus omega that's it so u of minus t means this 2 plus omega by minus omega so here this 2 plus omega by minus omega so then what you are going to get 1 by j into minus omega plus pi into delta of minus omega so if i, if I simplify this one what i am going to get so this i am going to get minus 1 by j omega but pi of this delta of minus omega is equal to delta of omega because it is a even function it is a inverse function is basically an even function so therefore delta of minus omega is always equal to delta of omega because it's a even function so if i simplify this one i am going to get minus 1 by j omega plus pi into delta of omega so this is a Fourier transform of u of minus t but i need the Fourier transform of f of t which is u of t minus of u of minus t means i need to subtract these two things so f of t is equal to u of t minus u of minus t and what is the overall Fourier transform just subtract this one and this one so as i've already told you here suppose if f1 of t has a Fourier transform if it has a Fourier transform of f1 of omega then for f2 of t if the Fourier transform is f2 of omega then what is the Fourier transform of the subtraction of these two signals it is f1 of t plus or minus f2 of t then what is the overall Fourier transform which is equal to the same thing just additional subtraction which is f1 of omega plus or minus f2 of omega if you do the addition means just do the addition here suppose if you are subtracting in the time domain means just subtract in the Fourier domain in the Fourier in the frequency domain also so here we are subtracting in the time domain so subtract even in the Fourier domain also so 1 by j omega plus pi into delta of omega minus of minus 1 by j omega plus pi delta of omega so this and this value get cancels so this value and this value will get added so 1 by j omega plus 1 by j omega is equal to 2 by j omega just subtract this one and this one so this common part is going to get cancelled and these two parts are going to get added so 2 by j omega is a uh, we can say the Fourier transform of the signal function so always remember whenever the f if the f1 of t has a Fourier transform f1 of omega and if f2 of t has a Fourier transform f2 of omega then summation or the subtraction of in a time domain same thing you have to do in the this is called as linearity property so this is called as the linearity property so f1 of t plus or minus f2 of t the Fourier transform is equal to f1 of omega plus or minus f2 of omega in the so this is called as a linearity property so finally i can say the Fourier transform of the signal function is equal to by j omega so let me give you one more important property this is called as a say, scaling property so scale the scaling property is if f of t has a Fourier transform f of omega then f of a t will be the Fourier transform is 1 by mod a f of omega by a that is the reason suppose if i substitute here a by minus 1 if a is equal to minus 1 what you are going to get f of minus t as a Fourier transform 1 by minus 1 is 1 by minus 1 mod is nothing but 1 1 into f of omega by minus 1 is equal to minus omega 
So therefore, same thing I've already told you. If f of t has a Fourier transform, f of omega, then f of minus t has a Fourier transform, f of minus omega, because this is a scaling property. f of e has a Fourier transform, just one by mod e into f of omega by a. So I have replaced a is equal to minus one, and I got like this, which is one by minus one. Mod is nothing but one minus one mod is equal to one. So f of omega by minus one is equal to minus omega. So f of minus t has a Fourier transform, f of minus omega. Same thing I have already told you here also. Based on this property only, I solve this question. So, u of minus t means wherever omega is there, it is omega by minus omega. So, therefore, this is the property that you always have to remember. So, this is called as the scaling property in the Fourier domain. In the Fourier, you can say the Fourier domain. So, therefore, the Fourier transform of the signal function is equal to 2 by j omega is the correct solution of this question. So, now we are going to solve the 82nd question. See the question here. A three phase thermal cage induction motor has a full load slip of 0.04. The motor is charging current at the rated voltage is 5 times of its full load current. The percentage stabbing on the auto transformer started to have the full load torque at the time of starting is. So, basically, in this question, what they mentioned is there is a three phase thermal cage induction motor and its full load slip is 0.04. So, I am going to use the auto transformer in order to start this three phase thermal cage induction motor. Then, with the help of this auto transformer tapping, at what percentage of the tapping of the auto transformer so that I can make the starting torque itself is equal to full load torque? So, listen carefully. How much amount of tapping of the auto transformer is required in order to make the starting torque itself is equal to full load torque? And in the question also, also they have mentioned that the starting current is 5 times of its full load current. So, based on these conditions, we have to find what is the percentage of the tapping of the auto transformer started in order to have the starting torque itself is equal to full load torque. So, what is four options? Option A, which is 100 is the correct solution of this question. So, let's solve this numerical. So, in the question, what they are given? The given data is the full load slip already they are given, which is 0 0.04. And in the question also, they have mentioned the starting current is equal to 5 times the full load current. Then, we have to find what is the percentage of the tapping we need to figure out and also they have mentioned the at the starting itself at the starting itself we are going to get the full load torque means the starting torque itself is equal to full load torque so at these conditions we have to find what is the percentage of the tapping we need to figure out so this is one of the formula you have to remember in case of auto transformer whenever you are going to use the auto transformer in order to start the three bus uh, spill gauge induction motor the formula is the ratio of the starting torque by the full load torque is equal to x square times the starting current by full load current whole square into the full load slip. So, this formula you have to always keep in your mind. So, this is the formula in case of the auto transformer. See, we can use the direct online starting, auto transformer starting and the star delta starting. These are the three different ways by which we can start the three phase scale gauge induction motor. I will give you each and every formula also for the remaining two methods also. So, this is formula for the for only for the auto transformer starting of three phase spool cage induction motor, which is the starting torque by full load torque is equal to x square times the starting current by full load current whole square into slip at full load. In the question already, we have we have already mentioned that the starting torque is equal to full load torque. So this ratio is equal to one because both are same. So this ratio is equal to one, one is equal to x square into but what is the starting current? Starting current is equal to five times of full load current. So here also full load current and full load current are going to be cancels whole square into what is the slip and full load already they are given just 0 0.04. So, simplify we have only one equation with only one unknown. So, 1 is equal to x square, x square into this is 5 square into 0 0.04. So, x square is equal to 1 by 5 square into 0 0.04. So, there is no square here. This one is there. So, there is no square. So, if you simplify this one. So, if you simplify this one, finally you are going to get the answer which is equal to 1. x is equal to 1. But in the question, they are asking the percentage. Percentage means you have to multiply by 100. So, percentage of x is equal to 1 into 100, which is equal to 100. So, in the question, they are asking the percentage of tapping means you have to multiply by 100 per the value, whichever the value you got. So, we got 1. So, 1 into 100 is equal to 100. So, 100 is the correct solution of this question. Suppose, let me give you other two methods of starting, which is the DOL starting as well as the star delta starter. See, in the case of DOL starter means direct online starting, then the formula is the starting the starting current by the, the starting torque by full load torque is equal to starting current by full load current whole square into slip at full load. So, no, so there is no x square tone. Whereas in the case of star delta starter, the formula is 
the starting torque by full load torque is equal to 1 by 3 times of the starting current by full load current whole square into slip at full load. So, these three important formulas always you have to keep in your mind. So, always remember in case of auto transformer, the formula is the starting torque by full load torque is equal to S square times of starting current by full load current whole square into slip at full load. Whereas in the case of DOL starter, the starting torque by full load torque is equal to starting current by full load current whole square into slip at full load. Whereas in the case of star delta starter, the starting dark wave full load torque is equal to 1 by 3 times of starting current wave full load current whole square into slip back full load. So these three formulas always you have to keep in your mind. So when, so whichever the question they have mentioned, this type of publication, that formula we have to use in order to solve the numericals. See in the case of star delta starter, we are going to connect the, we are going to connect the stator of the three phase filter induction motor in the star connection for the starting purpose, but later we are going to convert into delta. Whereas in the whereas in the dual starter, always the stator is always connected in the delta version for all the time. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So the final solution of this question is 100. So I recommend you to remember these three formulas. So whenever it is required, you can use them and you can solve it as per the question. So this is the correct solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the editor question. See the question here. A 100 kVA, 2000 slash 200 volt single phase two winding transformer is to be used as an auto transformer for stepping up the voltage from 2000 volt to 2200 volt. The ratio of the full load losses and auto, or, as an auto transformer to the two winding transformer is. So basically in this question, what they have mentioned is there is a 100 kVA at 2000 volt slash 200 volt single phase two winding transformer. So now we are going to change this into a uh, auto transformer of stepping up voltage from 2000 volt to 2200 volt. Then we have to find what is the ratio of the full load copper losses as an auto transformer to the full load copper losses as a two winding transformer of single phase transformer. So we have to find this ratio. The ratio of the full load copper losses of auto transformer by the, the copper loss of the full load copper loss of an Two in terms of we need to figure out. So it's a ratio we need to figure out. So the answer is option which is one is to learn is the correct solution of this question. So let's solve this numerical. So here this is the transformer. So this is the two in transformer of single phase transformer. It's rating is 100 kVA. It's rating is 100 kVA. So this is a two in transformer. So in the question they have mentioned it's a two in transformer of single phase transformer. The voltage are the rating of the voltage is 2000 volt slash 200 volt. So this is a primary winding and this is the secondary winding. It is a HV winding and LV winding. So now we are going to convert this two winding transformer into an auto transformer. In the question already they, they have mentioned what is the auto transformer rating 2000 volt slash 2000 volt slash 2200 volt. Already they have mentioned. So this is the same winding I have kept here like this. So this is 2000 volt. So this winding I am going to keep it above this one. So here I kept it above this part. So this is dot and this is dot. So this is plus or minus, this is also plus or minus. It is a series adding. So if you do the KVL, if I do the KVL, both are in series fashion. So plus 200 volt plus 2200 volt is nothing but 2200 volt. So this is the input voltage and this is the output voltage. You can see it is basically stepping up the voltage from 2000 volt to 2200 volt. So this is our transformer is basically stepping up the voltage. It is a series adding. So now, what is that? This is called as a, so this is a 2200 volt and this is a 2000 volt. So this is a low voltage and this is a high voltage. So this is called as a low voltage and this is called as the high voltage. Same thing everything. So what is the, in the case of all transformer, the high voltage is 2200 volt. In the, in the case of all transformer, what is the low voltage? It is 2000 volt. So now I want to find what is the turns ratio of this auto transformer. The turns ratio of this auto transformer is equal to, it's a ratio of the high voltage by the low voltage. So always remember this formula, the turns ratio of the auto transformer is equal to, it's a, it's a, it is a ratio of the high voltage of the auto transformer by low voltage of the auto transformer. And the high voltage is here, 2200 volt and the low voltage is 2000 volt. So do the ratio, if you do this ratio, we are going to get 11 by 10. So 2 11s are 2 10s are, so we are going to get 11 by 10. So 0 0 cancels. So, 2 11 are 2 tens are, you are going to get 11 by 10. But in this question, we have to find what is the full load copper loss as an auto transformer by full load copper loss at an, as a single phase transformer or two other transformer. This ratio we need to figure out. So, in this question, we need to find what is the ratio of the full load copper loss of an auto transformer by full load copper loss 
of a single phase transformer being to find this ratio. The, this formula already have, the, have already derived in the case of transformers. The formula is which is the full load carbon loss of an auto transformer by full load carbon loss as an of a single phase transformer which is equal to 1 minus 1 by A, the turns ratio of the auto transformer. So, this is the formula which is 1 minus 1 by turns ratio of this auto transformer. So, this is called as the full load copper loss, full load copper loss of an auto transformer by full load copper loss of a single phase transformer or two ionic transformer. It is equal to 1 minus 1 by turns ratio of the auto transformer. But I have already told you what is the turns ratio of the auto transformer, which is 11 by 10. So, substitute here. So, 1 minus 1 by 11 by 10. So, if we further simplify what you are going to get, so this thing will go upward. So, therefore, 10 by 11. So, take the same as 11, you are going to get. 11 minus 10 by 11. So, 11 minus 10 is 1. So, 1 by 11. So, this is the solution you are going to get. So, therefore, the full load copper loss of an auto transformer by full load copper loss of a single phase transformer is equal to 1 by 11. So, 1 is to 11 is the correct solution of this question. So, always remember which is the full load copper loss of an auto transformer by the full load copper loss of a single phase transformer is equal to 1 minus 1 by turns ratio of the auto transformer. Turns ratio of the auto transformer is equal to high voltage by the low voltage. High voltage is the high voltage of the auto transformer by VL is called as the low voltage of the auto transformer. So, this formula always you have to remember. Already, I have cleared this formula in the case of transformers. You can check this formula in the, the, the electrical machines playlist. I have already uploaded in the YouTube channel. So, you can see from there. So, this is the correct solution of this question, which is 1 by 11. This is the correct solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the 84th question. See the question here. The sandwich windings are used in dash type of transformers. So in this question, they are asking that sandwich windings are used in which type of transformers? Option A, spiral core. Option B, wound core. Option C, normal core. And option D, shell. So option D, shell type of transformers is the correct solution of this question. It is a very, very basic question because concentric windings are used in the, we can say, Concentric windings are used in the core type transformer, whereas the whereas this sandwich winding is used in the shell type of transformer. It's a very basic question. But let me discuss something more about this one. The answer is option B is the correct solution of this question because the sandwich windings are basically used in the shell type of transformers. But let me discuss something more about this one. So basically, we can say there are two types of transformers. One is called as the core type transformer, and the other is called as the shell type transformer. So, in the quote of transformer, we are going to use the concentric winding. So, in the quote of transformer, we are going to use the concentric winding. And the concentric winding is further divided into so many things, which is cylindrical winding, helical winding, crossover winding, and the disc winding. So, these are the, some of the different further, you see, this concentric winding is further divided into this many number of parts, which is cylindrical winding, helical winding, crossover winding, and the disc winding. But now, in the case of shell type transformer, we are going to use the sandwich winding. So basically, what is the meaning of sandwich winding? Sandwich winding means that we are going to split the HU winding as well as the LU winding into so many number of uh, types. This basically, in this high voltage coils as well as the low voltage coils are split into so many number of sections. As you can see clearly, this is the HU winding, LU winding, LU winding. So we are going to split the we are going to split the HU winding as well as the LU winding into so many number of sections. So each HU winding section is kept between these two LU winding sections. So you can say clearly, this is the HU winding is kept between the two LU windings. Again, we are going to have the HU winding. Again, we we'll have the LU winding. So we can say we are going to keep the one HU winding between the two corresponding LU windings. It is a sandwich means we are going to uh, keep this HU winding between these two corresponding LU windings. So this fall as a sandwich. Same thing in the case of sandwich also. We will have the like this one and this one here, here we are going to keep the, the liquid that will be there, right? So it is a sandwiching. So it is also same thing. HU winding is keeping it is kept between these two corresponding LU windings. So it is a sandwiching type of thing. So this fall as a Sandwich winding, that is the reason this fall as a sandwich winding means one HU winding is kept between the two corresponding LV windings. So, sandwich winding means in this high voltage winding as well as the low voltage windings are split into so many number of sections where each high voltage section is going to lie between the two corresponding low voltage sections. 
So because of this, what is the main important advantage? We can control the leakage flux also. So we can control the leakage flux here. The leakage flux is very, very less when compared to concentric winding. So in the concentric winding, the leakage flux is very high when compared to the leakage flux in the case of sandwich winding. So let me discuss here in the case of single phase transformer as well as the three phase transformers how we are going to make use of the co type transformer as well as the shell transformer. So this is a co transformer. So this is HU winding, this is the LE winding. So here in the case of three phase, so this is the R phase, Y phase, and V phase. Whereas the shell type transformer, so this is a single phase transformer, it is a single phase shell type transformer. So you can see here we are going to keep the so HU winding and then LE winding and then HU winding and then LE winding. So we are going to keep in this fashion. So one after the another. So this is a three phase transformer of the shell type transformer. So this is a three phase shell transformer and this is a single phase shell transformer. This is a single phase quadra quad transformer and this is a three phase quad transformer. So these are the different things always you have to keep in your mind. So if you see clearly here window the total window space is occupied by the occupied by the winding whereas here some of the window gap is present so these things always you have to keep in your mind so therefore here the leakage flux is higher in the case of port transformer whereas the leakage flux is very lesser in the case of shell type transformer because so this is the hu winding and this is the lv winding suppose some of the flux is linking with only the hu winding but not with both these coils it is called as the useless flux the flux which is linking with its own coil is called as a useless flux. Whereas here, always the flux is going to link between the two coils. Always, always the flux is going to link between the two coils because here H is present as well as L is also present. So therefore, there is no useless flux means the leakage flux is reduced in the case of shell transformer. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So finally, I can say in the core type transformer, we are going to use the concentric winding and here the leakage flux is very more whereas in the case of shell type transformer we are going to use the sandwich winding so because of this the leakage flux is very less means we are going to keep the HU winding between the two corresponding LV windings so because of this we can say the leakage flux is very very less so all the flux is always going to link between the, all the points so because of this the leakage flux is very less so finally I can say so concentric winding is used in the port type transformer and the sandwich winding is used in the shell type transformer. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So this is a thorough solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the 85th question. See the question here. The dielectric strength of the mica up to 30 degrees centigrade is around. So in this question we are asking what is the dielectric strength of the mica up to 30 degrees centigrade is around. So these four options option A which is 700 to 2000 kilovolt per centimeter. So option A is the thorough solution of this question. So let's solve this numerical. So basically, before I tell you what is the dielectric strength of the mica, let me tell you a small concept regarding the dielectric strength. What is the actual meaning of dielectric strength? Dielectric strength means, suppose you take any insulator, if you take any insulator, it is going to behave like an insulator up to a certain limit. Suppose if you apply electric field, which is lesser than the dielectric strength of this material, this mass electric field is called as the dielectric strength of that material. If you, if suppose if the outer electric field that you are going to apply, if you are going to apply an electric field which is lesser than the dielectric strength of this material, then this material is always going to behave like a dielectric material means it is always an insulator. So dielectric material is also called as the insulator. So whenever you apply an external electric field for this material and if this applied electric field is lesser than the maximum dielectric strength or the dielectric strength of this material, EMS is also called as the dielectric strength. So, if the applied electric field is less than dielectric strength of a material, then it is always going to behave like an insulator of the dielectric material. Suppose if you apply an electric field which is more than the dielectric strength of this material, then it is going to behave like a conductor. It is going to behave like a conductor. So, that is the reason we can say no material is perfect dielectric. Means we can make it to be a conductor whenever you apply, if you apply an electric field, extra electric field which is greater than, greater than the electric strength of the material means it is going to act like a conductor. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So what is the meaning of the electric strength means it is a maximum electric field. It is a maximum electric field that you can apply for a given material so that it can behave like a insulator. If you apply more than that it will become a conductor. But if you apply less than that means it, is, it will be almost like 
insulate them. That, that is the meaning of the dielectric strength. So now in this question, they are asking what is the dielectric strength for mica. Mica is very spill and insulator. It is used in the case of carburetor segments. It is used in between the carburetor segments of a basic machine. This one I already told you. So let me give you some different types of substances and the corresponding dielectric strength. So for helium, the dielectric strength is 1.5 kilo volt per centimeter because volt per distance is nothing but electric field. The unit of electric field is volt per volt per distance means either meter centimeter length. Like so therefore, the unit of electric field is volt per distance is volt per centimeter. So for helium, what is the what is the dielectric strength which is 1.5 kilo volt per centimeter. For air, the dielectric strength is 30 kilo volt per centimeter. Means if you and apply an electric field which is lesser than this, means it is going to act like insulator. But if you apply more than this value, means it is going to act like a conductor. That is the reason given the lightning condition, air is going to act like a conductor because the upper electric field is more than the dielectric strength of air. So it is going to act like a conductor during the lightning time. So whereas for SF6, yes, it is 98 kilo, kilo volt per centimeter. So you can see here. SF6 gas has a more dielectric strength when compared to air. It is nearly twice. It is nearly twice. You can see it is more than twice. It is nearly more than twice. Whereas for mica, it is 1180 kilo volt per centimeter. It is the exact value of the dielectric strength of the mica, which is 1180 kilo volt per centimeter. Whereas for diamond, it is 2000 kilo volt per centimeter. It's a very, very huge value. So that is the reason diamond is always a insulator for all practical obligations. So you can see clearly it is a very very huge value. So these data always you have to keep in your mind because definitely at least you will see one question in the examination. So for helium which is 1.5 kilo volt per centimeter, for air which is 30 kilo volt per centimeter and for SFS gas which is 98 kilo volt per centimeter and for mica which is 1180 kilo volt per centimeter and for diamond which is 2000 kilo volt per centimeter. So in examinations they may ask that the electric strength of the as such, this gas is more than air. But if you want some approximate value, means it is more than twice the dielectric strength of air. So the direct, the dielectric strength of as such, this gas is it is nearly twice the value of the dielectric strength of air. So these things you can see clearly. So these are the exact value. So this is the exact value. So this so this is basically the exact value. But in the question, they are given a range. What is the range they are given? 700 kilo volt per centimeter to 2000 kilo volt per centimeter. Yes. This exact value 1180 kilo volt per centimeter is lying between these two ranges. Yes. So this is the correct solution of this question. So you can see only 1180. 1180 is lying only from 700 to 2000 per year. 3000 to 5000. It is not lying in this range per millimeter millimeter. So definitely it is not the solutions. So B and C are wrong. Here it is 3000 to 5000, but the exact value is 1180. It is not lying in this range. So option B, option C, and option D are wrong. Only option is because the exact value, what is the exact value? The exact value is 1180 kilo volt per centimeter. It is lying between the, it is lying between the 700 kilo volt per centimeter and the 2000 kilo volt per centimeter. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So finally I can say the exact dielectric strength of the mica up to 30 degrees centigrade, the exact value is 1180 kilo volt per centimeter. So this value is lying only in the option A range. So option A is the correct solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the sixth question. See the question here. There is a 100 megawatt generator with a regulation parameter R of 0.025 hertz per megawatt. Has its frequency fallen by 0.2 hertz. If the turbine power remains unchanged, by how much the reference power setting is changed? So in this question they are giving there is a generator of 100 megawatt. And also they are given the regulation parameter R is equal to 0 0.025 hertz per megawatt. And in the question they are given the frequency is fallen means the frequency is dropped by 0 0.2 hertz. And the turbine power is remain constant means the prime mover, the input power is always constant. Then by how much, then by how much the reference power setting is changed? By how much the reference power setting is changed we need to figure out. So it is four options, option D which is 8 megawatt is the Correct solution of this question. So let's solve this numerical. See in the question that the given data, in the question they are given the, the regulation value, R is called the regulation which value is 0 0.025 hertz per megawatt. And also they are given the because of this, there is a drop of frequency, delta F is called the drop of frequency, delta F is equal to minus. Here we have to, in the question they have mentioned, 
the frequency is swollen by 0.2 hertz means the delta f is equal to 0.2 but delta f is a sign sensitive whenever the frequency is dropped or fallen means you have to use the symbol negative suppose the frequency is rise means you have to use positive so in the question only they have mentioned the frequency is fallen so it is a sign sensitive so delta f is always a sign sensitive fallen means always you have to, you have to use a symbol negative rise means positive so here delta f is nothing but negative because there is a drop in frequency of the frequency is fall so minus 0.2 hertz then what is the delta pg pg is delta pg is called as the the amount of change in generation which is contributed by the load so delta pg is called as the the amount of reference power setting is changed or the change in generation which is contributed by the load we need to figure out so this value we need to figure out so the relation between these three parameters is which is delta pg is equal to minus delta f by r it's a very very wonderful formula so delta pg is equal to minus the delta f by r so you know the value of delta f you know the value of r so just substitute and get the value of delta pg then so you know each and everything just substitute these values and substitute and simplify you will get the result of delta pg so delta f is equal to minus 0.2 hertz so delta f is equal to minus 0.2 hertz and is r is equal to 0.0 25 hertz per megawatt so you can see minus to minus is equal to positive and the hertz x cancels so megawatt goes to the upper word you are going to get finally 8 megahertz so if you simplify this you are going to get 0 0.2 by 0 0.025 megawatt hertz x cancels and megawatt goes to the upper part you will get megawatt here so if you simplify this value you are going to get 8 here so 8 megawatt is the correct solution of this question so delta pg is equal to minus delta f by r R is called as the regulation and its unit is hertz per megawatt and delta F is called as the, the amount of frequency change. It is positive whenever there is a rise in frequency, if it is negative means the frequency will drop or fallen. And in the question the frequency is fallen means you have to use a symbol minus it because it is a sign sensitive. Delta F is always a sign sensitive. So you know both these values just substitute in this formula and simplify you will get the value of the delta P G which is called as the this much amount of reference power which is changed so this is the 8 megawatt is the solution of this question so always remember delta f is negative whenever there is a drop in frequency and delta f is positive whenever there is a rise in frequency because delta f is a science sense to delta f is a science sense to minus means whenever there is a drop in frequency or fall in frequency positive means whenever there is a rise in frequency so this delta f is always a science sense to so this point always you have to keep in your mind so the answer is 8 megawatt is the solution of this formula of this question so delta pg is equal to minus delta f by r so answer is 8 megawatt so now we are going to discuss the 87th question see the question here it is a match the following type question in the group one they are given the type of the cable and in the group two they are given the, the rating of the working voltage means the rating of these cables for what range of uh, the readings of voltages these cables are used so they are given the belted cable screen cable and pressure cables so they are given some ratings so belted cables is, is always used up to either 11 kV or up to 22 kV also. With some modifications, we can use up to even 22 kV also. So belted cables can be used up to 11 kV or 22 kV by using some modifications. Whereas for the screen cables, screen cables are basically used up to from 22 kV to 66 kV. Whereas the pressure cables are used beyond the 66 kV. So let me discuss something more regarding these cables. So now we will discuss about the, the types of cables based on the classification of the cables based on the type of the construction. So generally these are the three types of cables which are classified on the based of which are classified on based on the construction, which is the first one is the belted cables, second one is the screened cables, and the third one is the pressure cables. So belted cables are used up to 11 kV or 22 kV. So by using some modifications, we can use even up to 22 kV also. Whereas for the screen cables are used from the range of 22 kV to 66 kV. Whereas the pressure cables are beyond are used beyond the 66 kV. See all these cables, welded cables, screen cables, as well as the pressure cables are basically used for the three-phase service. Three-phase service in order to transmit the power, in order to transmit the power. For three days transmission, we are going to use all these three cables, which is measure cables, screen cables, as well as the pressure cables. So you have to understand the ratings also. So you, you have to know the ratings of these cables also. So measure cables are used up to 11 kV or 22 kV, whereas the screen cables are used from 
20 kV to 60 kV, the rise of cables are used beyond the 60 kV. So, this is the classification of the cables based on the construction. Now, we will discuss the, the classification of the cables based on the voltages. So, there are five types of a classification of cables based on voltages, which is low tension cables, high tension cables, super tension cables, extra high tension cables and extra super voltage cables. So, these are the five types of classification of the cables based on the voltage ratings. The first one is a low tension cables. The range of operation is up to 1 kV only. For a second one is a high tension cables. The range of operation uh, from 1 kV to 11 kV. Whereas for the super tension cables as a range of voltage from 22 kV to 33 kV. Whereas the extra high tension cables as the range of voltage from 33 kV to 66 kV. Whereas the extra super voltage cables as a range above the above the or beyond the 132 kV. So this range also you should know. So you should know the classification of the cables based on voltages as well as based on construction. So their respect to ratings also you should always to able to remember because in the examinations sometimes they will ask you the memory based questions also. So finally I can say that cables based on construction are melted cables, steam cables as well as the pressure of cables. So melted cables can be used up to 11 kV or up to 22 kV. Whereas steam cables are used from 22 kV to 60 kV. Whereas the pressure cables are used beyond the 60 kV. So these things always you have to keep in your mind. So therefore we can say option C, option C which is uh, yeah, major cables means up to 11 kV, skin cables means from 22 kV to 60 kV, whereas the pressure cables means beyond the 60 kV. So option C is the correct solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the edit the question, see the question here, which is the power plant which has the transmission and the distribution cost very high is. The power plant which has the transmission and the distribution cost quite high is. So option A steam power plant, option B diesel power plant, option C nuclear power plant and option D hydroelectric power plant. So there is four options, option D which is hydroelectric power plant is the current solution of this question. So therefore, let me discuss why, why the hydroelectric power plant has the high transmission as well as the distribution cost when compared to the remaining power plants. So option D is the current solution of this question, but let me explain why it is like this. So now we will discuss some important points regarding the hydroelectric power plant. So in the hydroelectric power plant, the initial cost is very, very high because we need to construct the dam. So in order to construct the dam as well as some excav excavation work. So in order to construct the dam and remaining works, definitely you need a lot of money. So therefore, the initial cost is very, very high. Whereas the running cost is very zero. The running cost is zero because water itself is used as the fuel. So the cost of water is zero. So therefore, the running cost is equal to zero. So we can say in the hydroelectric power plant, the initial cost is very, very high. And the running cost is zero. And if you compare the efficiency when compared to other power plants, the hydroelectric power plant has a huge amount of efficiency. So therefore, the we can say hydroelectric power plant is very, very efficient. And the efficiency is nearly equal to 85 percentage. So when compared to thermal power plant as well as the nuclear power plant, we can say hydroelectric power plant is very, very efficient. And also, the maintenance cost is also very, very low. So when you compare to remaining power plants, the maintenance cost is also very, very less. But the transmission cost as well as the distribution cost is very, very high in the case of hydroelectric power plant because we need to construct the dam in the hilly areas because there only we can have the, the storage of water. The storage of water is present in the hilly areas. So definitely you have to construct the dam there. So it is very, very, very far away places from the consumer. So these hilly areas are very, very far away from the consumers. So definitely you have to make the transmission from those hilly areas to the consumer people. So definitely you need lot of wires and lot of cost is there. So because of this, the transmission cost as well as the distribution cost is very high in the case of the hydroelectric power plant because it requires a high cost of transmission lines as the plants are located in the hilly areas. So definitely these are very, very quite far away from the consumers. So definitely you need lot of initial cost or we can say the lot of transmission as well as distribution cost is very, very high. So I already told you basically these plants are located where large reservoirs can be obtained by constructing a dam. Example is in hilly areas, in the hilly areas only, definitely you will get a storage of water like reservoirs. 
So therefore, we have to construct the dam, and from this huge amount of far away places from the consumers, we have to transmit all this power generated generated power to the consumers. So definitely, you need lot of transmission cost as well as distribution cost is very high. So therefore, if you compare the transmission as well as distribution cost of different power plants, we can say the transmission as well as distribution cost of hydro power plant is more than the transmission and distribution cost of nuclear power plant is greater than the than the thermal power plant. So hydroelectric power plant has used huge thermal transmission as, as transmission as well as distribution cost and is least in the thermal power plant. So this is the relation that you always have to keep in your mind. So medium is the nuclear power plant. So in the case of hydro power plant, we will have the more transmission as well as di distribution cost and least in the case of thermal power plant. So least transmission as well as distribution cost is very less in thermal power plant. So I have already told you, we have to construct the dams in the reservoirs. So basically reservoirs are in the hilly areas. So you need to construct the dam and you need to, these are very very far away places from the consumers. So you have to take all the straps and lines. We have to transmit the lines from those areas to the consumers. So you require a lot of lines, lot of cost is involved in them. So because of this, we can say the hydroelectric power plants are having the huge amount of traction as a cost as well as distribution cost and the least in the case of thermal power plant and the medium in the case of nuclear power plant. So now let me give you a rough picture of the hydroelectric power plant. So this is a reservoir. So the reservoirs are basically very stored in the hilly areas. So we have to construct the dams in the hilly areas and we have to transmit those power from these far places to the consumers. So you need the transmission and most of huge cost is required in order to transmit the power from these remote areas, the very hilly areas to the consumer people. So therefore we can say, so hydroelectric power plant and this is the transmission cost and this is the distribution and this is the consumer. So you can see clearly, so this is the reservoir and this is the dam. So therefore we can say a huge amount of cost, the transmission cost as well as distribution cost is involved in the case of hydroelectric power plant because here the reservoirs are present only in the case of hilly areas. So there we have to construct a dam and then we have to transmit the lines from those far away places to the consumer. So definitely the amount of transmission as well as the distribution cost is very high in the case of hydroelectric power plant. So this is the correct solution of this question. So now we are going to solve the eighth question. See the question here. The capacity of a static wire compensator to be installed at a bus with plus or minus 5 percentage voltage flux using this dash. If the short circuit capacity is 7000 MVA. So in this question they are asking that basically we have to find what is the capacity of the static wire compensator. Means it is going to it is going to give you the reactive power. It is going to give you the reactive power. That is the basic amount of the static wire compensator. So how much amount of capacity of the static wire compensator we need to install at a bus. So at a bus what is the percentage of the, uh, percentage of the voltage fluctuation which is 5 percentage. 5 percentage of the voltage fluctuation is present at the particular bus. And if the short circuit capacity is 7000 MVA, then we have to find what is the capacity of the static power capacitor. So all these four options, option D which is plus or minus 350 MVAR. Option D is the first solution of this question. So let's solve this numerical. So listen, the question here, the answer is, in the question already, they have mentioned what is the, the short circuit MVA, they have given 7000 MVA. Already this value they are, they are giving the question. So now they are given the, the voltage, the percentage of the voltage fluctuations at the bus is 5 percentage means what is the per unit value 5 by is equal to 0 0.05 per unit. So voltage per unit value is equal to 0 0.05. So I am going to assume the per unit current is equal to 1. I am going to assume the per unit current is equal to 1. Then what is V per unit is equal to I per unit into X per unit. So V per unit is 0 0.05. I current is equal to 1, then what is the x per unit? So definitely you are, you are, if you saw this one, we are going to get 1 into x per unit is equal to x per unit. So therefore, x per unit is equal to 0 0.05. So this is the value of the, the per unit impedance or the per unit reactance is equal to 0 0.05. So now, what is the MVA base we need to figure out? Or we can say the capacity of the static wire. The capacity of static wire is nothing but it is an MVA base value. So this value we need to figure out. So what is the formula? The short circuit MVA is equal to MVA base by X per unit. X per unit is also called as Z per unit. We can go, go for anything. So short circuit MVA is the ratio of the MVA base by X per unit. Then what is MVA base? MVA base is equal to short circuit MVA into X per unit. So MVA base is equal to short circuit MVA into X per unit. 
So short circuit can be a value, you know, it is 7000 MVA. This 7000 MVA. So this is 7000 MVA. And this value, what is the exponent value? It is 0 0.05. It is unitless. It is unitless. So it is 0 0.05. Just multiply these two values when you are going to get 350 MVA. But I have already told you, static work compressor is going to give you the reactive power. Reactive power means always you have a, the reactive power is already always known as R. So you have to use MVA R because it's a reactive world is going to convert the reactive power by the static compressor, static work compressor term. So you have to use a symbol here R. So therefore, because of the capacity of the static war compressor is 350 MVR. So this formula is very much important. Short circuit MV is the ratio of the MVR base by exponent. So MVR base is equal to the product of the short circuit MV into exponent. So this value which is 7000 MVA and this value which is 0 0.05 per unit is limitless. So with the product of these two things we are going to get 350 MVR. So in the question they are given the V per unit. So I have assumed the iPhone value is equal to 1. So based on this I got the exponent. So substitute here and simplify to get the result. So this much amount of capacity of the static work compositor we need to install at that particular mass. So let me give you some detail analysis regarding the static work compositor. So what are the things which are going to happen because of this static work compositor? So basically the static work compositor is always used to increase the active power flow in a line. So because of this static work compositor, the amount of active power flow in a transmission capacity of a line is increased. The amount of active power flow in a transmission line is increased. And also, it is also going to improve the transient stability of the system. It is also going to improve the transient stability of the system. And also, it also improves the load power factor. And it is going to reduce the line losses. So, these are the things that are going to happen because of this static war compressor. So, whenever you keep a static work compressor in a power system line, definitely the amount of active power flow in a line, in a transmission line increases, as well as the transient stability of a line is also increases, as well as the load power factor also increases, and then the line loss also decreases. So, these are the advantages by keeping the static work compressor in a transmission line. So, these things always you have to keep in your mind. So, finally, the answer is plus or minus 350 MBA is the correct solution of this question. So, this is the last question of this lecture. See the question here. Pick up the correct statement. So, they are given the four statements and they are asking which is the correct statement. So, let's see the option A. Self GMD of the conductor depends only upon the spacing between the conductors. Statement B. Mutual GMD between the conductors depends only upon size, shape and the spacing of the conductors. And the option C. Self GMD of a conductor depends only upon size, size and the shape of the conductor. And option D, which is mutual, G, mutual GMD between the connectors, depends only upon the size and the shape of the connector. So, these four options we need to check what is the correct statement. See, self GMD, self GMD, or we can also self GMD is also called as a GMR. So, GMR of a connector basically depends only upon the size as well as the shape of the connector, and it is independent of the spacing between the connectors. So, option C is the Correct solution of this question. So, self GMD is also called as a GMR of the connector. It depends only upon the size as well as the shape of the connector and is independent of the spacing between the connectors. Whereas the GMD, GMD is also called as a mutual GMD. It depends only, it depends only upon the spacing between the connectors and is independent of the size as well as the shape of the conductor. So, only option C is the correct statement. See, a self GMD of a connector, it depends only on the only on the shape, shape and size of the connector. So, option A is wrong. Option B, I have already told you, depends only on the spacing between the connectors. It is independent of the size and shape. So, option B is also wrong. Whereas, mutual GMD, it depends only upon the size and the C is also wrong. It is, I have already told you, self GMD or the GMR of a connector, it depends only upon the size as well as the shape of the connector and is independent of the spacing between the connectors whereas the mutual GMD it depends only upon the spacing between the connectors and is independent of the size and shape of the connector. So let me discuss something more about this one. So option C is the correct solution of this question. So let me discuss here what is the meaning of self GMD. Self GMD is also called as the GMR. GMR means geometrical mean radius or self GMD means self geometrical mean distance. Basically, it is calculated for each base separately. So, for each and every base, we need to calculate this one separately. See, this GMR or the self GMD, self, G, self GMR, sorry, 
self GMD or GMR, it depends only on the size as well as the shape of the connector and it is independent of the space in between the connectors. So always remember which is the self GMD or the GMR, it depends only on the size as well as the shape of the connector. It is independent of the space in between the connectors. So whereas GMD, GMD is called as a geometrical mean distance, it is going to give you the equivalent distance between the conductors. It depends only on the space in between the conductors, but it is independent of the size as well as the shape of the conductor. So these two statements always you have to keep in your mind. So finally I can say that the, so let me give you a small example here. Suppose I have two conductors, two wire, um, as a signal by system, just two wires. So this conductor has a radius of R and this conductor is also has a radius of R. And center to center, the center to center, the, the, the distance between them is called as a D. Then what is the GMD? What is the equivalent distance between these two conductors which is equal to D? And what is the geometric mean, geometrical mean radius which is equal to P to the power of minus 1 by 4 into R means 0 0.7 divided into R. So what is the inductance per phase value which is mu to mu by 2 pi into ln of GMD by GMR Henry per meter? And what is the capacitance per phase which is uh, 2 pi epsilon naught epsilon r by ln of gmd by r uh, fat per meter. So if you see clearly gmd as well as gmr, see this gmr is only there in the case of inductance but not in the case of capacitance. So this is a very important statement. gmr is present only in the case of inductance calculation but not in the, but not in the case of capacitance calculation. So what is the geometric mean? Geometrical mean distance, it is the equivalent distance between the, this equivalent distance between the two conductors which is equal to the and geometrical mean radius is equal to 0 0.7 double eight r. So if you see clearly, the geometrical mean distance is depending only on the distance between the conductors. It is independent of the size as well as the shape of the conductor. It is a equivalent distance between the center to center distance. It is only depending upon the distance. It is independent of the size as well as the shape of the conductor. Whereas the geometrical mean radius, it is calculated for each and every phase each and every phase separately we need to calculate and its values depending only on the size as well as the shape of the conductor it is independent of the spacing within the conductors so this point i am trying to tell you so finally i can say this gmr is also called as the self gmd it depends only on the size as well as the shape of the conductor it is independent of the spacing within the conductors whereas geometrical mean distance or mutual GMD, it depends only on the space and the connectors and it is independent of the size as well as the shape of the connector. You can see clearly it is depending only on the distance D, it is depending only on the radius of the connector. So finally I can say self GMD or the GMR, it, uh, basically it is calculated for each and every phase separately and also this GMR of a connector, it depends only on the size as well as the shape of the connector and is independent of the spacing between the connectors. Whereas the GMD, it is equal to the distance between the conductors. Means it is an equal distance between the connectors and it depends only on the spacing between the connectors and is independent of the size and the shape of the connector. So this point always you have to keep in your mind. So GMR is used only in the calculation of the inductance but not in the case of capacitance. So these formulas are very much useful. So option C is the correct solution of this question. Thank <laughs> you.